My name's Robert Smallshire. I am going to talk about deliberate architecture. But actually, I think the subtitle here is uh, probably the real title of the talk. It's about responding to requirements rather than following fashion. So I'm going to talk a little bit about fashion this morning. So our industry is very different from other in industries, I think, like aerospace engineering, for example, or reservoir engineering. So one well, something I have some experience with insofar as we have an exponential growth, almost, in terms of the number of people engaged in building software in the world. I mean, it really is growing at a almost unmanageable rate. And so our industry is almost unique, in, and that, insofar as that has also been true over a fairly long period of time now, and I expect it to continue, as software works its way into more and more areas of our lives and our business. The second interesting aspect of the demographics in our industry is that many of us are effectively self-taught amateurs when it comes to software engineering. Even those of you in this room who have a degree in computing science have a degree in computing science, not a degree in software engineering. And these are quite different things. Right? Remember that computing science has almost nothing to say about computers. But at the end of the day, software you write that never gets executed on a computer isn't very interesting in a business sense. The third demographic aspect that leads to the state that our industry is in is the fact that we have very high turnover in our project. So you can think about turnover within a project or turnover within a business. And if you look at the numbers, you'll find that the half-life of a software developer with respect to a particular project or particular code base is about three and a half years. So what that means is that every three and a half years, you can expect half of your colleagues to be replaced by new colleagues as people move on to other projects. Okay, so essentially, we are a collection of rapidly growing, inexperienced amateurs. <laughs> and I mean, you're laughing because you know it's true. I mean, how many people here actually have a degree in computing science? OK, so maybe a quarter of the people in the room. How many people have a degree in software engineering? Like three people, all of whom I know. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, one of the effects that arises from this is that rather than us being driven by good engineering principles and good engineering practices, like the people who build our airplanes, we are very much driven by fashion, essentially. And here we have clothing fashion. I think it's an interesting example because the functional requirements for clothing haven't really changed for a very long time. <laughs> right? I mean, they, they, have a, they need to fulfill a few basic needs. Right? They need to protect us from the elements. This is more important in somewhere like Norway than other more clement places. And they need to preserve our modesty to the extent that we are interested in doing that. But in spite of that, there's a lot of churn in fashion. And you know, I'm wearing some clothes that are fashionable now, and they may not be fashionable in a few years, and vice versa. Stop looking at my trainers like that. <laughs> These are like two years old. So things change for not necessarily very good reasons, but people feel a strong emotional urge, maybe not some of the guys in this room, uh, to, to keep up. <laughs> right? I've hidden my drink in the undergrowth here. So, actually, I do have one piece of good software architecture advice, and it's the only piece of real solid advice I'm going to give you. It's on this slide already. And this autumn, or fall as Americans would call it, layered architectures are in. <laughs> What's interesting though is, I mean, that's a very visual way of looking at, uh, at how fashion is presented. But you know, we, as an industry, are very much guilty of doing exactly the same thing. And we, you know, we talk about some things with metaphors which are uh, very pejorative, we talk about spaghetti code or ravioli code. And we have these nice visuals which look nothing at all like any software I've ever seen. 
right? Which shows something, which is, I, I, I imagine, is supposed to be presented as a good thing. These little bubbles floating around and these, they almost look like cells, don't they? These microservices here, or cakes, or tarts, or machines. And software doesn't look like this, but we feel the urge to present it in ways that make it appealing to us. Particular architectures need to be appealing, okay? Cupcakes are much more appealing than many other types of food to most of us. So, you know, and I, I haven't drawn these, right? These are taken from consultants' industry reports, right? <laughs> on, I'm not gonna name them, on how to promote, for example, microservice architectures. And we promote them as cupcakes with cherries on top, lovely. And if you don't like cupcakes, you can have donuts. So also from an industry report. Now, there's an irony here because one of the consultancies out there which has produced some of these pictures is also quite well known for another product they produce, I think, every year, which is the Gartner Hype Cycle. So who here is familiar with the Gartner Hype Cycle? It's essentially a model of why things are, are fashionable. So you can see here, we have some new technology is introduced, innovated, a technology trigger. And then shortly afterwards, we pass through this peak of inflated expectations where all of our hopes of being saved from the mess we've got ourselves into are pinned on this new technology. And we have vastly overinflated expectations of how much benefit that can bring to us. We only look at the good aspects of the technology. At this point, we don't have the experience to understand the negative sides of the technology. So we're only seeing the upside risk. We're not seeing the downside risk. But over time, as we build experience and learn about the trade-offs involved in using a particular technology, the enthusiasm begins to fade. And we discover that some of our choices perhaps were not so smart and we enter the trough of disillusionment. I, I don't think the horizontal scale on this diagram is linear, by the way, because after some extended period of time, when we begin to understand the trade-offs, when we begin to understand the context, particularly the context in which a technology is inappropriate, in which it is not a good fit, then we ascend the slope of enlightenment. And ultimately, we reach the plateau of productivity and actually finally begin delivering value to customers rather than just faffing around with new technology. So it's interesting to think about how some of the technologies we might be familiar with have traveled along this curve and are, indeed are traveling along this curve now. So I've just put some sample software architecture styles on my picture here, and we can see them travel along. So it's a very old architectures like pipes and filters and layered architectures, plug-in architectures, model view controller architectures. And many of these things are over in the plateau of productivity now. They're fairly well understood. We know when to use them. We know when not to use them. Unfortunately, some of them are very unfashionable, even if they are an extremely good fit to the problem, particularly things like pipes and filters architectures. And many architectures have traveled this cycle more than once in disguise. You know, so we've had Smalltalk MVC, and then WebObjects MVC, and then Spring MVC, and then Ruby on Rails, and all the rest of it. And so these things have, sub, you know, they live another life in, with another name. Some things seem destined to stay, perhaps for an extended period, possibly even forever, in the trough of disillusionment, things like service-oriented architectures. Others have perhaps recently passed the peak, event sourcing, very exciting new way of thinking about building systems, storing a log of everything that's happened. People are now really uh, beginning to appreciate the problems associated with that, particularly in light of new European Union privacy regulations coming in, and the fact that storing everything about everybody forever might actually be a problem. And then we have microservices, which is probably at or near its peak. Cupcakes, if you aren't sure what they are. And 
I think there's no small irony that service-oriented architectures are in the trough here and microservice-oriented architectures are at their apogee. Really the same thing apart from questions of scale. And then we have things which are very, really very much in the ascendancy now. I made this slide about a year ago, so it should serverless should probably be rather higher towards the peak at the moment. It's probably getting a little nearer to the peak of inflated expectations, but people are very excited about it. I'm excited about it. We're building a system that's using serverless technologies right now because we're excited about it. So even people who understand their own flaws, like me, are susceptible to the, uh, the problem I'm talking about. We can also put practices on this diagram. I mean, I, think, I really think Agile has passed the peak of inflated expectations. Lots of people these days are conscious with some of the failings of an Agile method methodology, especially Agile as commonly practiced rather than Agile as was originally intended, which are quite different things. And software architecture practices, like actually bothering to design your software, um, which is not really, doesn't really fit into Agile, I, I like to think that some of those things are coming back now and we're much wiser in how we apply them. We're smart enough not to spend months and months doing big design up front. Okay? But we are, I hope, smart enough to think about many of the other good things that software architects were talking about 10 or 15 years ago. I guess UML is always <laughs> going to be here. There, some things you just have to abandon. They, they become historical artifacts. They were interesting at the time. Even people like Grady Booch, who was the driver behind UML, I think now largely regrets it. But we learned something, though. We learned that uh, building systems of code from diagrams doesn't really work very well, except in very narrow domains. So the reason everything is very fashion-driven is that we are deeply compromised, biased individuals. And it's extremely difficult for us to be objective. And I am not going to go through all of these biases now. They're probably all in play concurrently at any given moment. But let's look at a few of them. Availability cascade at the top. What's an availability cascade bias? That means that if you go to a conference and every third talk is about microservices, you begin to think that microservices are a good idea subjectively, even if that is not necessarily true in your context. Right? So just repeated exposure to ideas, because they are popular, makes you think they must be intrinsically good. So you have to correct for that. Remember that as you go through the rest of this conference, or in fact, any other conference. The recency effect. You've probably seen these things in, like, in magazines and things like music magazines of you know, best records, best music made ever, right? And they're always heavily biased towards music in the last 18 months, right? Because people can remember it. And also because people are young, right? The people who read these magazines are young. They haven't had the, they haven't lived through the 70s and 80s, 90s, right? So there's a strong recency effect. Hyperbolic discounting. This basically means that our future selves regret the decisions that we make today, right? Has that happened to anybody here? We discount the, the true impact of the decisions we make now. We don't understand the full cost of them in future. And that's compounded by the fact that we tend to leave projects because of the high turnover. So rarely are we exposed to the consequences of our own decisions. Yeah, and I think the last one was pro-innovation bias. Just because something is new and fancy, it must be good. So where does this leave the software architect? We tend to think of software architects as people concerned with the structure of systems how the large components or modules fit together, what their responsibilities are, how they relate to each other. And that's maybe quite a traditional view of software architecture. I, there was something else that, uh, when a lot of the classic software architecture was done, I guess back in the late 90s, around the turn of the millennium, there was a lot of talk about 
software qualities. And for me, this is a really central aspect of what software system design should be all about. So the structure is important, but the structure is there in order to facilitate the building of features and to produce systems with particular qualities. And this is really tricky. And it's really tricky because it involves trade-offs. And making trade-offs is really hard because you have to understand that if you uh, chase after one particular quality of the system, you are going to compromise some other particular quality of the system. So not all of these are drawn in opposition to each other, but I'll just highlight a couple. The, I guess the classic trade-off is performance against maintainability. I'm doing another talk later today where you'll see an example of this. I'll show how to make some code much faster, but at a significant, co significant cost in maintainability. When you optimize things, you're making them easier for the computer to do and harder for us to work with, usually. Security and usability tend to trade off. It's kind of annoying doing all those sign-in things, isn't it, all the time? It gets in the way of you actually doing what you want to do. Many things can be traded off against cost, of course. Making reliable systems tends to be more expensive than making unreliable systems. So understanding the trade-offs involved is really, for me, what, um, and the trade-offs in qualities in particular is really, for me, what good software engineering and system design is all about. So you might think that the chocolate cake and the apple are, you know, obviously they have very different qualities, but one of them is definitely a lot more tempting. So I really want to talk about deliberate design for software qualities. How can we begin to think about building systems or just getting the right frame of mind to build systems that have the right qualities? So I mentioned Grady Booch a few minutes ago, and we're going to go back to some of his thoughts on this. He may have produced UML, which was a failure, but he's also a very deep thinker. So let's come up with some very good stuff. So let's start by trying to understand the incident forces on a system. And there are lots of forces acting on a system. We have a system here, the blue square. It's a solution to some particular problem we have. And there are various forces acting on it. Those forces come from customers. They come from the users. The definition of enterprise software is that these are distinct people. <laughs> Business owners. Marketing and sales people who are trying to promote this thing the developers who have to build it, the people who have to test it, the people who are managing the building of the thing, and many, many other people are involved in any business that involves software, which is most businesses these days. And of course, forces are, or constraints are also imposed by other systems. You, know, you have to integrate with some other system. It, you're not in a position to change it in any way. You just have to deal with that force that comes from that system. So we have all these forces on the system. And what Grady Booch said, which I, I don't think it's entirely obvious until you've heard it, is that all of these forces have to resolve to zero. And the reason they all have to resolve to zero is that if they don't, either your system just buckles under the forces and collapses and implodes on itself and is no longer useful, or it accelerates off to infinity. So there needs to be some kind of balance here. So we can factor these forces into four groups. You might be able to think of other groups, but I think these four encompass most of the forces that we think about when we talk about software systems. There's the functions, the functionality of the system. There's the qualities of the system, which I just spoke about. There's constraints, uh, and there are principles. For my money, the, uh, the qualities and the constraints are most important. So the functions are, what is it for? What use cases does it support? What does it allow people to do that people couldn't do previously without the system? What functions does it have? The qualities are, how well should it do those things? Sometimes these are called non-functional requirements. Not a, a, quite an ugly phrase. So performance, scalability, security, maintainability, usability, fault tolerance. You can go to Wikipedia and find a list of about 200 of these things. 
Because there are 200, it makes the trade-off problem really difficult. I'll come back to that later. There are constraints, things that limit our approach. How much money we have, what the law says, what regulations say, how much time we have, how many people we have, how experienced those people are. I can tell you how experienced they are, not very, as I explained at the beginning. And then there are things we choose, principles. How would we like to build it? Given all these constraints and forces, we still have some space to maneuver. There's, a, there's still a solution space. We haven't collapsed that solution space down to, a, down to a point. So we can choose architectural styles. We can make technology choices. Ultimately, it probably doesn't matter whether you write it in Java or C Sharp. Right? Those things are largely equivalent. Standards we choose to adopt. So basically, how would we like to build it? And for my money, the qualities and the constraints are really the main things that should drive the software architecture. The features and the functions will drive the software architecture in aggregate, but generally speaking, adding or removing an individual feature does not require that you come up with a new software architecture to support that feature. Yeah. So I mentioned non-functional requirements. Non-functional requirements tends to get quite confused with software qualities, and people almost use them as synonyms. I prefer to think of non-functional requirements as, well, requirements. They are things going into the process of building software, and software qualities as qualities or characteristics that are exhibited by a software system as built. So the relationship between non-functional requirements and qualities is the same as the relationship between functional requirements and features which support those use cases. So it's been claimed in the past that features and qualities are kind of orthogonal, as I've drawn them here. And what's very interesting to me, and this has become apparent to me over a decade or more, is that we treat these things very differently. The way we handle them in our projects is very different. Features tend to be, or the requirements that lead to them, tend to be explicitly captured. You know, they are a ticket in our Scrum backlog or our Kanban board. They're intentional. We tend not to accidentally implement features. They're quite a deliberate thing. They tend to be tracked. We know whether a feature has been implemented or not. Right? It's still on the to-do backlog, or it's being built currently. Or you, know, you can go to a developer, and generally speaking, you can ask them, what feature are you building? And they probably give you a reasonable answer to that question. They're designed and implemented. There's a specific act of implementing a feature. They're tested and verified by some means. And if the software we're working on, for example, comes with a user manual, remember those, they are specifically documented. There might be some instruction on how to exercise and use that feature to achieve, some, to achieve the use case. And they're essentially digital. I mean, either the feature's there or it isn't. I mean, it might be buggy, but it's essentially there or not, right? Contrast that with qualities. They tend to be informally captured there's that bit at the back of the requirements document template that nobody really is sure how to fill in that asks you to think about these kind of things. And people try to write something because they feel they have to because it's a template, but people don't think very deeply about it. They are emergent. They tend to emerge from the software. And I'm going to come back later in the talk to this word emergent because it bothers me. They're untraceable. It's very difficult for me to go to you, you know, we're looking at your code, and we say, well, where is which file of source code is performance implemented in? Which file of source code is security implemented in? Can you show me the scalability class? Right? I mean, they're just nonsense questions, right? Because they are cross-cutting <coughs> concerns. They are throughout the whole system. They tend to be retroactively redressed because we're never really sure whether we've delivered a system with the right level or not until we've got it out in the field and being used. So then we have to come back and correct shortfalls. And we tend to monitor them in production. So 
how, what is the throughput of a system, for example. We can monitor that while it's running. And they tend to be largely undocumented, and they're essentially analog features. You know, you can have more or less performance. Okay, you can have more or less usability. Maybe security is an exception to that because half security is really no security. So it's been claimed, as I mentioned earlier, that these things are orthogonal. This was claimed in software architecture and practice a long time ago now, 15 years ago. Functionality and quality attributes are orthogonal. I'm not sure this is quite true, because I can remove all the features from your software and make it very secure. So I think this is an ideal, but it's uh, probably unachievable. But you should think about how you handle qualities in your own organization. You probably have a very explicit process for handling features and requirements. Think about how you handle qualities. So I want to zoom in on this word emergent. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from this guy, George Henry Lewis, a philosopher, Victorian philosopher. And this is the sentence where he essentially coins the word emergent. This is the first use of the word emergent. You don't have to read this huge screen full of Victorian English. It's quite hard going, even for me. George Henry Lewis was essentially a failure as a philosopher. No one's really ever heard of him. He's mostly famous for being the lover of George Eliot, the novelist. So let's extract some snippets from here and try to turn them into something like modern English. So he says, with emergence, there is a cooperation of things of unlike kinds. He's not talking about type systems, but he's talking about emergence. The emergent is unlike its components insofar as it cannot be reduced to their sum or their difference. Right? So we, if you have one feature, and then you implement another feature, how many features do you have? You have two features, right? Performance and usability don't work that way. If I have one feature and add another feature, has my usability doubled? Probably not. It's probably gone down by some complex function, right, that we don't fully understand. So emergent is really a code word for what we would call nonlinear systems. I'm not sure that phrase was in use when George Henry Lewis was around, maybe it was. So what do we know about nonlinear dynamical systems, such as building software systems? We know that they're really hard to model. We know that they're really hard to predict the future behavior of, and we know that they're incredibly hard to control if we're in the situation of building control systems. So emergent is really a code word for all these things. So even though emergent is used in quite a nice way in lots of presentations, be, be wary of it. So normally when I show this slide when I'm doing this talk, I say, probably later in this conference, somebody will show a slide with this picture on it. Thankfully, Venkat has already done it in the keynote this morning. <laughs> And shortly after somebody says, somebody shows you this picture on a slide, they will say the word emergent. And normally this sapling is cradled in the nurturing hand of a software architect. What I'd like you to do is every time you hear the word emergent, which really means hard to model, harder to predict, and hardest to control, I'd like you to mentally replace that with accidental, because that's what they mean. So back to my thoughts about how software systems are constructed. We have some system, we have some set of requirements, we have an agile process, of course, which delivers features into the system. You've all seen those diagrams of Scrum, haven't you, with that kind of circular thing spinning around, which is each sprint, and another circular thing spinning around, which is something else. And it's like a diagram of the internals of a pump, right? And that's because agile methodologies, as commonly practiced, are basically a feature pump, right? 
pump, 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 pump features into the software system. You can watch it ballooning up and inflating as the features are pumped into it. But over time, here's that word emergent again, the qualities of the system emerge. Right? And they don't necessarily emerge in a way that you particularly like or your users particularly like. The only thing you can be sure about them is that they will emerge. Right? Your system will have a usability. It will have a security. Right? It will have a maintainability, whether you thought about those things ever. Right? They will emerge. They kind of come from nowhere. It's amazing. But somebody's going to notice. If you don't notice, your users are going to notice. What's interesting is that, of course, the agile process works over days and weeks, whereas these things emerge over months and years. Right? And this delta in wellness, if you like, is the kind of aggregate of all the properties, gets encoded into thousands of defects and then get fed defect reports, which sit in gyro forever, and then fed back into our system. Now, anyone who's ever worked on control systems will know that this time delay here is like having an incredibly brutal low-pass filter on the feedback loop in this system. Right, which makes it incredibly hard to control in short time. So your defect tracker is just a low-pass filter. And these are hard to address because they are cross-cutting concerns. So what we would prefer to have instead is deliberate design for these things and be very conscious of them in advance and deliberately choose systems which exhibit, which are likely to exhibit the right kinds of qualities at the right levels, given trade-offs that we are comfortable with. This is what software architecture is all about, really. It has to provide a system that facilitates the development of appropriate features, but it must also think about deliberately choosing software architectures that deliver within the constraints we have, time, money, people, but also at the right quality levels. Winston Churchill said it much better than I ever could. He said, however beautiful the strategy, you should occasionally look at the results. <laughs> so what makes software architecture really difficult is that there's this fitness landscape of different qualities and these complicated trade-offs. There's really nothing simple about it. And I, I really see the job of the, the software designer or the software architect as navigating this complex landscape that we can't see and it's difficult to model to try to get the software system into a good place in that landscape. Now, it would be easy if it was like this, if it was a, I say easy. <laughs> I've worked on two-dimensional optimization problems which are horribly difficult. But you know, it would be easy if there were only two variables we had to optimize for. Of course, the reality is there's a, it's a kind of 96-dimensional space of all these different software qualities which relate in really difficult ways, and finding your way around this is really hard. And the way we do find our way around it and the way we manage is by choosing to build systems using architectural styles which have known qualities. Right? So don't choose them because they are fashionable. Choose them because they have the right set of qualities and make certain trade-offs. So I like to think of architecture as a counterbalance to what I call agile featureism. So to a great extent, functionality is independent of the software structure. I can implement the same features in many different ways using different technologies. So here's my web Twitter client. Here's my iOS Twitter client. I don't know. Maybe this is written in Swift. Maybe this is, this is probably written in JavaScript. OK? They both essentially have the same kind of usability, and they interoperate with things. The native app's probably a lot faster than the JavaScript app. I'm pretty sure the maintainability of the JavaScript app is appalling. The Swift app is probably pretty good. On the other hand, the web app is incredibly easy to deploy. Somebody just needs to hit refresh, and they, get, they potentially get a new version. Whereas deploying the 
thing, new app through the App Store, or if it's a built-in app, might require an, an operating system update. You know, that, there's more work involved in that. The web app is potentially very portable to lo across lots of different operating systems. I could even use the web app on my phone, whereas, of course, the Swift-based iOS app is locked into iOS. Right? So here's a, an example, a very simple example that you probably all have on your phones now of essentially identical systems with the same feature set supporting the same use cases, but very different trade-offs, very different software qualities have been selected. Yeah, as I said, you know, we could potentially run the web app on our phones anyway. But this might integrate less nicely with the operating system than the native app. So back to the cupcakes and other confectionery. When we are choosing a software architecture, we shouldn't choose it because it is literally flavor of the month, right? We should choose it because of the qualities that it exhibits. And over time, we have a pretty good idea what qualities these different systems exhibit. Microservices are arguably quite modifiable. The services should be small enough that I can quickly rewrite one. I don't really have to necessarily worry about maintaining it. I could just replace it. OK? So choose software architectural styles based upon the qualities they are likely to give your software system. So I'd like to say I don't often spend my evenings reading other people's PhD theses. That's not really true. I do sometimes. This is uh, the PhD thesis by Roy Fielding. This is the thesis from 2000 where he described the RESTful software architecture, so REST APIs. It comes from this thesis. And it's very interesting. You should go and read it because most people have completely misinterpreted what he said. But on page 15, there's a really nice quote, if you get as far as page 15. Some architectural styles are often portrayed as silver bullet solutions for all forms of software. However, a good designer should select a style that matches the needs of the particular problem being solved. So he's counseling us here to not follow fashion, but to choose things based upon their known behaviors and qualities. In the world of building architecture, people have said similar things in this book about constructing buildings. Personal stylistic concerns have no place in the work of the professional architect. You know, we are supposed to be doing engineering. It should be objective as far as possible. We should try to correct for our biases. So how do we deal with qualities when we're building software. Well, you know, we have our Kanban board, our features progress across this board from left to right, the stuff to do, the stuff we've done. It's hard to build qualities into this. We can't have a ticket that just says performance or security because they're untraceable or untrackable, right? So what the Agile folks have said is, well, you need to build your qualities into your definition of done. Right? So it's not allowed to be done until it meets, you know, it's been written, it's been checked, it's been reviewed, comes with all the right tests, it implements what we asked for, and we add to that, it meets the qualities, or does, it enhances the qualities in a good direction, it doesn't degrade the qualities in a bad direction. And this seems like really sensible advice. However, it doesn't work, because what it leads to is this, where nothing is ever done. And people will very creatively add new columns to this thing. <laughs> yeah, so we, we tend to, these days, deploy things early and then monitor. Um, I guess one of the problems is they are, some of them can be monitored. So you could monitor performance in the field once you've deployed your system into AWS. You could, to some extent, monitor usability. You could figure out how many people successfully managed to buy a book on your shop, right, on Amazon. 
It's hard to monitor things like portability. I mean, how do you deal with portability? Well, as an example, Mac OS, which started life on PowerPC and has since moved to Intel, obviously portability was a concern somebody at Apple very wisely had in mind, and later to ARM as well, along in the guise of iOS. And the way that was done is from the very earliest days of Mac OS, they had people compiling it for Intel, even though Apple was not at that time building any computers with Intel processors. Right? So where you can't monitor, you need to put practices in place that maintain a quality like portability, say. Even though there's no immediate value from that. OK. And of course, we can deal with this through review. And one of the things we do is software architecture reviews. And when we are reviewing people's systems, there's a very strong focus on qualities of the system, where the shortfalls are, and things that can be specifically done to redress those shortfalls, and bring them up in the level of consciousness in the organization. So, and of course, there are many, many people involved who you need to talk to about those qualities. It's not just about code. All kinds of people are involved in building not just software systems, but software intensive systems. There's some broader system, it involves hardware, people, and software. So I'd like to advocate for people who are software architects to really focus on software qualities and be the champion of software qualities in their organization. And I'm going to finish now with some advice that I was given in my previous job, which I, I think is excellent advice. And I'm, it's not my quote. I can't find out where it originally comes from. If anybody knows, please do tell me so I can add some attribution to the next slide, which is this. And this is advice to the software architect. You look after the quality attributes, and the features will look after themselves, which sounds kind of cryptic but also profound. And I think there's a lot to be said for this, because what is being said here is that there will be no shortage of people in your organization thinking about features. right? The salespeople are selling features. Developers are interested in building features. The features are very explicit in your project management tool. They're probably explicit in your defect tracker. You have scrum people who just mostly care about features. There are project managers. Nobody is going to forget to implement the features. right? So to a first approximation, as a software architect, you can kind of forget about the features. As long as your system supports the addition of the features people want to add, that's fine. Okay, so you, obviously there is some impact on the architecture, but mostly as a software architect, you should focus on the software qualities. So you look after the quality attributes, and the features will look after themselves. Thank you very much. <laughs> I would normally take questions, but I have another talk to prepare for, which is in the next slot. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you can come and find me. I'll be around the conference. Do